Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we'll be discussing the early councils of the Church and how doctrine developed in those early times. Officially, there have been 21 ecumenical councils in church history, but I think the first 10 will be enough for this season. Today we'll be discussing the fourth official ecumenical council, the Council at Chalcedon. Considering how much time passed between the first three councils, the Council of Chalcedon only happened a short time after the one at Ephesus, a mere two decades later in late 451 AD. With the view of Nestorius, dividing the natures of Jesus too much, having been condemned, it was only a short time before the opposite error was made, that Jesus had only one nature, a sort of man-god, not unlike Hercules. This was proposed by a man named Eutyches, and the position would later become known as monophysitism, meaning single-naturism. The patriarch of Antioch, a man named Domnus, first realized that this view was heretical, and soon Eutyches had been removed from his position, but he was on good terms with the emperor and asked him to call another council in Ephesus. However, the council called by the emperor was a sham. Only those who supported Eutyches were allowed to speak, and the letters and delegates sent by the pope clarifying the doctrinal issues that the Monophysite claims touched on weren't given the chance to share their position with the council. This in turn led to persecution of those who held on to the true faith, as Eutyches was coddled by his supporters, including the emperor, and many of those who opposed his claims were mistreated. The Pope tried to establish a new council in Italy to correct the evil that had been done at Ephesus, but the Emperor was obstinate in his refusal to comply, and we might well have seen a minor schism in the Church over 500 years before it actually happened, if the Emperor hadn't suddenly died. The new Emperor, Marcion, wasn't nearly as friendly with Eutyches as the last Emperor had been, and wanted to undo what his predecessor had done by calling a council as the Pope had asked. However, at that point, the Eastern Church was mainly turning against Monophysitism already, and Attila and his Huns were causing trouble in Western Europe, so it was hard to find time to attend a council. Still, Marcion kept pushing for one and ultimately got his wish. After some early scheduling issues, the council was opened in Chalcedon, mainly to address Monophysitism. The council certainly did this, reaffirming the Nicene Creed and condemning the errors of monophysitism, therefore definitively establishing that Jesus has two natures, not just one. The council also passed a number of other rulings, most of which were disciplinary, but because many of these have been forgotten today, I think it's appropriate to include a brief summary of them. Punishments for the sale of ordinations began, and the council confirmed the binding and lasting force of council canons. Restrictions were placed on managing worldly businesses and goods by monks and the clergy, who also weren't allowed to hold public office or go on military service. People were forbidden to found monasteries against the will of their bishop. Disputes between clerics were ordered to be resolved by whatever bishop had authority over the region, or by a regional council in the case of disputes between bishops. Clerics weren't allowed to be appointed to two churches at once, and no one in the church was allowed to encourage world leaders to divide their provinces so that there could be more openings for church leaders. Restrictions were placed on marrying heretics or raising children in a heretical faith by those who read and sing in the church. Young women, less than 40, were forbidden to become deacons, and those who married after being ordained had to lose their position. Monks and those virgins who devoted themselves to Jesus, a possible precursor of nuns, were forbidden from marrying. Arrangements were made to seek justice within the church when a bishop wronged those in their diocese. Conspiracies and secret societies were completely forbidden among the clergy and monks, on pain of loss of position within the church. A clergyman who made accusations against a fellow clergyman or bishop needed to be investigated first, and clerics were forbidden to take the goods of their recently deceased bishops. Consecrated monasteries were forbidden to be turned into secular buildings, and penalties were set up for delays in appointing bishops. It was ruled that every bishop should also have an administrator of church affairs, so that the managing of church property is audited, and not just controlled by one man at his own discretion. This, combined with the prohibition against conspiracies, severely discourages corruption in the sense of mismanaging church property for personal gain. Apart from this, there were also a number of disciplinary matters where previous rulings and hierarchies were enforced, like clerics needing to obey their bishops, and bishops still not being allowed to meddle in the diocese of other bishops. Of course, there were bound to be other issues popping up, as we'll see next time. Next, the Second Council of Constantinople. 
That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.